Listen up. This is the words of Jonda. She didn't put listen up. I did. So anyhow, she put down uh, Friday night, 630. We're going to start the cookout. Uh, the church is furnishing the hamburgers, hot dogs, and hot dog buns. Uh, she said asking everyone to bring a side dish or a dessert. Uh, also, anybody who can bring some uh, pop and water. She wrote, wear old clothes. I guess you all know what that's all about. So that's, um, you will get wet probably. But this year, uh, this year we are having the food in the fellowship hall. I know before time passed, we've had it outside. But, but uh, this year we're going to have it in the fellowship hall. Might make things a little bit easier. And might, people might be able to get separated from not getting soaking wet. Water balloons are forbidden inside the fellowship hall. So, but um, but anyhow, and and she wrote down all church members need to help clean up after the fireworks. Her words. So, I agree. I agree. Said that because she wasn't going to be here, so she put me doing it. So, but anyhow, but we do want everybody to try to invite invite everyone you can, and we do need to know by um, we need to know by Sunday night who all wants to go to uh, who who all wants to go to Kings Island. We need your name wrote down. We need to know that way we can get uh, parking and we can get tickets and everything. We need to know by by this Sunday night, and we're we're going on the twenty second of July. Um, I got a call, let's see, I think it was yesterday or day before, or day before yesterday, and there a guy coming all the way from uh, Tennessee, three and a half hours away, he's coming up here wanting to be baptized at the church. He watches, I know he watches all the time on, on YouTube, and, uh, and he called the other day, and I mean, I've seen his name several times and commented back and forth and things, and, and he called the other day and asked me if, if we could baptize him, and so I told him how we normally do it, either we go down to the river or we do it here afterwards on Sunday night, and he said Sunday night would be great, so we want to let everybody know that, and, and so we, it's exciting, it's exciting, and he said, well, I, I know I'm not the farthest anybody's drove, because there was somebody come all the way from Missouri, and he, I guess he was here that night, or he was watching the night that that happened, so, but I think he comes in second, I think three and a half hours is second place, so you get a silver, silver medal for that, but, but, but let's pray for it, and if anybody... Uh, feels the need to be baptized. I mean, you know, if a person's rededicated their life to the Lord or, or however it is, or you've never been baptized, you've been saved but never baptized, uh, we, we will have the baptistry filled up. Lord's will, we have the baptistry filled up on Sunday night. And Sunday at the end of service, just like we always do, we'll, uh, we'll have our uh, baptismal service. So let's, let's pray about that. So, all right, let's all stand. This Sunday night. This Sunday night. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Well, which that's. I was excited about that. That was good. I, sometimes just them little things like that just I don't know cheer you up. It, you know that people that people care enough that people will come that far. And you know I know we've we've sent our books out all over. I mean we've sent them all over the United States. We've sent uh, down to Texas. We've sent some. We've sent them up north. We've we've sent them a lot of places. And uh, and and we do have. By the way, we've still got a few left. We we went through about all. I think we've got a, maybe 40 or 50 left, 30 or 40, I don't know, of the 300 of the Aesop meets Jesus. There, we did get 200 more of the Christian's armor. I, I really didn't think we would go through any of the, those. I just kind of wrote that up for the uh, for the teenage class, and, and it seemed like people was, uh, took them and reading them, I guess. So, But uh, we got 200 more of those back there, and they're they're all back there in the, in the foyer, free if anybody wants them. You're more than welcome. If anybody's watching on Facebook, YouTube, and wants a copy, just message me. It works best if you can message me. That way I can keep up with it. But just message me personally and give us your address and name and address, and we'll try to try to get those out to you. So. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, brother Wendell Arnott. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, all right. Let's rem let's remember that right now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's good to see them. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's all stand then and pray the Lord would. Yeah. 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 
ten. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, baptism Sunday. Yeah. Sure did. <laughs> All right. Burrow, quit, quit, quit interrupting <laughs> Tim. <laughs> no, I'm joking. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to come out to the house of God. God, so thankful for each and every one that's here. And God, we just ask, Lord, that you would bless this church, bless this service tonight. God, that you would anoint everything that is done, that everything would be done for your glory, for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God. Lord, we know there are a lot of sickness right now, so God, I ask that you would touch. Lord, I ask that you would, Lord, move on Brother Wendell Arnott, Lord, who needs that touch right now in a mighty way. I ask that you would help him. God, we ask you, Lord, to, to touch Sister Patty's uh, daughter-in-law or daughter, what, uh, Savannah needs a touch. Lord, we ask that you would help her. God, that you would that you'd help each and every one of us. Lord, I know there are a lot of sickness in the church, a lot of sickness in the community right now. We ask that you would help them. God, that you would just bless in a mighty way. God, that as we always pray, let us decrease you increase. Let us get out of the way that we can see the power of God moving in this church tonight. We love you and we appreciate you. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Bye-bye. 
you're sick and afflicted and you don't know what to do, just call on King Jesus. He will see you through. King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray. You're down in the valley and you don't know what to do. Just call on King Jesus. He will see you through. King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray. I'm down here in trouble. Lord, send an angel by my way. They could all fall in prison. Long about the midnight hour, he began to call on Jesus. He heard his prayer, King Jesus. I know you hear me when I pray, and I'm down here in trouble. Won't you send an angel by my way? I've come through the valley, and I've reached that mountain top. I'm looking for that city where the Lord I just can't stop. King Jesus, I know you hear me when I pray. Yes, I'm down here in trouble. Won't you send an angel by my way? If you want the Holy Ghost and you don't know what to do, just call on King Jesus. He will be you through, King Jesus. I know you hear me when I pray. See, I'm down here in trouble, Lord. Won't you send an angel by my way? All right, we come to you tonight with the evening's offering goes to the Bible study. It is good to see everybody. Got a good crowd tonight. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, John chapter 16 or, and verse 7. What we'll actually be doing tonight is going through the book of Acts, but I want to um, actually I want to go through the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts. So I think that's enough to bite off. <laughs> brought a sleeping bag didn't you no I'm joking I'm joking um, but John chapter 16 and verse 7 we've been preaching and you know it seems like the Lord the way the sermons have been coming it's like they've been building off one another it's like alright well we got to realize the you know we got to realize the the soul the spirit and the body and we got to recognize that each person possesses that they have a, a, a soul and a body and then at the you know when a person has the spirit of the world has to be removed from them, and the spirit of God has to be put on them. And 
And, you know, it's so important because when you die, all it simply is is whatever, whatever spirit is attached to that soul, that body's going to go back to the ground from whence it came, and the, the soul is going to go somewhere. And man became a living soul, a forever alive soul, and that soul is either going to go to heaven, if it's got the spirit of God attached to it, or it's going to hell if it's the spirit of the world. And so it's so important to always keep in mind how serious this is. You know, they've taught, they've preached that to me ever since I started over here about how important it is to, to, uh, to make, to, to take this very seriously and to, and to keep our eyes on the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He started something for us. He'll finish it for us, but we got to, we got to take it serious. And so the other night we was preaching about protecting our temple and what we got to do to protect our temple is we've got to be on guard. We've got to watch. We've got to be alert for any attack that's going to come. We've got to take a position of strength. We've got to be active in this thing. And then we have to, I believe you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't believe it's an option that you be filled with the Holy Ghost. I need, I believe you need the, you need the Holy Ghost. And more than that, you need to keep your vessel full. You know, the Bible talks about the foolish virgins and it says that the foolish virgins when the call came at midnight they knew what was wrong they knew that their lamp had run out of oil because oil is not something that's simply going to leak out of your vessel you burn it up and if you don't have a continual outpouring in it and that's what you need when it says be not drunk with wine wherein is excess but be filled with the spirit it's it's likening a drunk man who drinks in excess to somebody being filled with the holy ghost because you want that continual outflowing in you. And if you, if you desire that, you've got a hunger and thirst after the things of God. But if you will, he'll put something in you. And when he puts it in you, it'll flow out of you. And so we need the, we need the Holy Ghost. So the message tonight is, why do you need the Holy Ghost? Why do you need the Holy Ghost? John chapter 16 and verse 7. Jesus said these words, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Again, I simply want to preach this, why you need the Holy Ghost. Subtitle, The Holy Ghost in the Early Church. The Holy Ghost in the Early Church. Does it ever bother anybody else whenever you read through the, the book of Acts and then you look at the modern church and you see what a what a difference it is. You know, you juxtapose one beside the other, and it's like, all right, this bunch here, when they walked out, they would lay them out in, people would lay them out in couches and beds that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by would heal the sick. But they would cut handkerchief off Paul's body, that Paul would go down, a man named Eutychus that fell out of a window one night and died, that Paul would go down, stretch himself on him, and raise him from the dead, that Peter would go to the house of Dorcas and raise her from the dead, that they'd walk up to a gate beautiful and silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I'll, you put that little cup away because what I'm about to give you is more than that little cup will ever be able to hold. And to see the power that they had, and then you look at the modern church, and the modern church, I mean the modern Pentecostal church, believes in every, we believe in every one of the gifts. The Bible says the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. We call them gifts of the Spirit, which the Bible said every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. It, it really isn't talking about gifts. It says the gifts of healings in that, in that list of nine, of nine manifestations. But all it says is the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It means to profit everyone else. The reason why we need the gifts is to benefit everybody else. It's not for personal glory or vainglory. It's, it's, it's a mature spiritual maturity that we need that. That way we can help one another. But you can't claim to have the gifts or the manifestation of the Spirit if you also don't have the fruit of the Spirit. A lot of people, they got so much hatred in their heart and bitterness and backbiting and all these things in their heart or pride, and then they want to know, well, I believe in the gifts. That's, you know, that's, that's the argument. It's like, well, I believe in the gifts, and, and I know the gift of healing is for us today. It's like, yeah, the gift of healing is for us today. But it says the fruit of the Spirit up, up beside of the works of the flesh, it said, which are manifest, and it begins to list them. But then it goes down to the fruit of the Spirit is love, Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. It says here is the 
fruit of the Spirit, and we also have the manifestation of the Spirit, but a lot of people want the manifestation of the Spirit, and they never focus on any of the fruit. They never examine their own tree. They never figure out if this is even the right kind of tree, and if it is the right kind of tree, why is it not bearing the fruit that it needs? Because the only way we're ever going to see the gifts is if we have got the fruit, and if the fruit is not producing, it's either not the right kind of tree, so it means it needs to be regenerated. I mean, it's all it is. It just simply needs to be a, a new tree a grafted in as a wild olive branch grafted into the vine. We need to be the right kind, and if we're not, if we are the right kind and we're not producing, because we've talked about that before, a lot of people would call themselves children of God. They believe in the universal fatherhood of God, and it's like, well, we're all brothers, uh, the brotherhood of man. It's like, Okay, mankind in itself, yeah, you know, you could trace it back to, to the first man and, and woman, but when it's all said and done, the brotherhood of, of man is not, we're not brothers and sisters. The only way we're brothers and sisters is if we are in the Lord. Beyond that, we're not brothers and sisters. Everybody is not my brother. Not everybody calls themselves a Christian is a Christian. And you have to be able to determine which one's which. And it's not for you to go around and judge everybody in and out and say, well, you are and you're not. That's not the point. When it talks about to judge not that you be not judged, it means you don't judge somebody and mimic their behavior. If you think that you can get by with everything and you do what so-and-so does because that you think that they, they're going to make it, and that's the argument that sinners have a lot. They'll say, well, if that one can make it, then I've got no worries. It's like, yeah, you've got a lot of worries. You know, you've got a big problem because you've picked a hypocrite to, to mimic uh, them and you think you're living better than they, but at the end of the day, it's not going to be you know, it's not you two going to stand on the scales and which one of you's better is going to get to go to heaven. It's like, if you don't line up with the book, you're going to hell. So you've got to be born again. And you, and you need to have a hunger for the things of God. And you can't make somebody have that. I mean, I'm telling you, sometimes I feel like I'm taking my head and ramming it into this pulpit, but trying to tell people how much they need it. But at the end of the day, I can't make you serve God. You can't make me serve God. But we can teach in such a way that people would want you know, when I came into this church, I seen what people had, and I wanted what they had. I did see that. I saw the power of God get on them, and I wanted what they had. So when you go back and you look at the early church, I mean, it bothers me sometimes because I think, look what they could do, and then look at what we should be able to do, and then where do we, where do we line up in that? Go to Acts chapter 1. Again, I just want to kind of skip through the first 10 chapters of the book of Acts because I I believe it's a, it's a life of application. Again, when we talk about, when I, you know, the first thing I think of when I think of Acts, you know, I, I immediately go to those places where miracles happened or tongues, you know, whenever the Holy Ghost came down in the upper room, Acts chapter 2, when, the, when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. Or go to Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius, the house of Cornelius, received the Holy Ghost and they all spoke in tongues. Or the upper coast of Ephesus in Acts 19 where they all where they uh, were filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, uh, Peter asked, or Paul asked them, he said, what were you baptized to? They said, well, to John's baptism. He's like, well, that's, that's fine, but, you know, he took them into a deeper, a deeper depth. And so when we think of the book of Acts, a lot of times that is the first thing a Pentecostal will think of is we'll think of the outward manifestations and how we would like to have those. We cannot have outwardly if we don't have inwardly. If it's not in our heart, then the flesh is, we are never going to see the outward manifestations. You can, you can speak in tongues all you want to. But at the end of the day, if you do not have a, if you have not been filled with the Holy Ghost, that tongue don't amount to a hill of beans. Amen. Demons can imitate a tongue. You understand that? Whenever uh, Moses walked into the imperial court of Pharaoh, the Bible says they had two magicians there, and they was able to, they was able to mimic the, they was able to take their rods, throw them down, and they turned into serpents. It wasn't sleight of hand. I believe they actually, by the power of Satan, was able to do those things. If all you're looking for is, is tongues, if all you go to an altar and pray for is, Lord, let me speak in tongues, the devil will oblige you with a tongue, keep that heart just as cold and dead, and, you, and you, there be no change in you. When you get to Holy Ghost, when he comes in, I believe the tongues will come out. But if all you're looking for is simply an outward manifestation, the devil will be fine to give you one of those. And we see, we see that play out in the modern church. I mean, you know, I, I believe in Pentecost with everything in me. I mean, there's... I, I do. If I had to say what I believe in, I believe in old time Holy Ghost salvation. That's what I believe in. I'm not saying that as a talking point, a platitude to stand up here in the pulpit. I'm talking about read the history of the church and go back to 1900. In 1901, when 
Agnes Osmond spoke in tongues in Topeka, Kansas, as they went back to the Bible and they dug through the Bible of what was the of what was the manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and every one of them came up with the same answer. It looks like it's tongues, and they began to pray for it, and the power of God come in, and after that, the Azusa Street revival, and and the power of God. It would, it's amazing. It's amazing. I'm telling you, every person, every Pentecostal should go and study the first, the first 20 years of, of the 1900s and the power of God that would come down so mightily. But Satan began to corrupt it. And little by little, it, it turned into this holiness to where it was not about the power of God and the power of love and, uh, and love for Jesus Christ. It began to become, it became, began to become something more than that where it was a holier-than-thou attitude to where it was self-righteousness and better than everybody else. And then you go into the 1950s, the late 1950s, early 1960s, what is known as the charismatic movement. It was when the gifts of the Spirit began to bleed over into every other ecumenical group. And there what they was doing is they believed that they believed that the Roman Catholics could pray the rosary in tongues and then it was in every bunch. And all it was is they was focused on speaking in tongues, bringing that into their church. They wanted to keep the church. They didn't want to, they didn't want to go with old time holiness and salvation, but instead all they wanted to do was say, well, we can do everything we want to do as long as we speak in tongues. And then it goes into the neo-Pentecostal movement that is today. And, and the neo-Pentecostal movement, I mean, you all know that. Turn on TBN. Look at what passes for it right now. I mean, man, they got people, they got people on, on worldwide TV that stands up and, I mean, big networks that stand and teach people how to talk in tongues and then they, all they talk about is prosperity and they make a doctrine out of that, that I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. They take a simple greeting in the Word of God and they turn it into a, into a doctrine. They make it dogmatic about something that, well, it, he wanted everybody to be in health. That's not what he was saying. It'd be like me standing at the door and saying, well, I hope you had a good day. And then somebody turn around and make a denomination of it and say, well, uh, everybody should have a good day. That's not what it's talking about. You know, when we read the Bible, you've got to understand the ethos of the Scriptures. You've got to read that Bible and not cherry pick that thing for what you want it to say. You've got to read it and you've got to study it and you've got to try to figure out what was they saying and how does that apply to my life and not what I can pick out of it and uh, make some sort of Frankenstein monster into a Bible that, I, that will suit me. But it's how, how will I match up to this Word of God? Because when it's all said and done, my life and your life is going to be based on that. Not about what we thought about religion, how much we went to church, but whether or not we live by this book or not. And when you look at the book of Acts, when you go through the, the first ten chapters of the book of Acts, you'll see something here. Because, again, the modern church has, has, some of them only focus on tongues. A lot of people only focus on a dress code. Some of them argue over a formula of baptism. Some of them have the, all they worry about is prophecy. That's, that's become the new thing now. Every, every number means something. And don't get me wrong, I've studied numerology. I know that there's numbers that are significant in the Bible. But I've seen people manipulate that and twist that and, and call everybody all the way from Constantine to Charlemagne to Nero to, to uh, Warren Buffett as being the Antichrist and, and, and arguing about it. I had a guy tell me the other day that a guy that he worked with back in the 80s, he was convinced that Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Because he said, well, look at his name. His name is Ronald uh, Wilson Reagan, 666. And said he was so convinced of it that he went home and killed himself because he said that he didn't want to go through the tribulation and the end times and he knew it was coming, so he killed himself. And this guy knew this guy. He worked with him. And it's like, you know, when you start getting into the error and you don't understand what the Bible is actually talking about, and I believe it's a dangerous thing. I believe when people get up and say, well, God told me, listen, that flesh will tell you a lot of stuff. But if it don't line up with the word of God, man, you better be uh, scared of that. And, and I see people doing that. They're running all over this country trace, uh, chasing after so-called prophets because they prophesy what they want them to say. You know, we got a conservative mindset. I do too. I, I rejoice that Roe versus Wade. I, I rejoice over conservative views. But at the same time, I don't get wrapped up. I don't want to get wrapped up in politics. And I don't want to manipulate the word to suit what I want it to say. And I've seen people do that. I've seen people that they, they listen to these so-called prophets and Donald Trump, according to them, has been getting in 15 times. It's like, well, he'll be back in February, March, April, May, June. It's like, well, no, 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 and he's still not. And it's like, but why do you care about that? I mean, do you believe in a sovereign God? I mean, I'm not saying, I believe when I stand up here in this pulpit and I preach on politics, 
It is not to try to change a national election, a local election. I couldn't change with my little voice, change a dog catcher's election. My whole point about it is for you to examine your heart and make sure that what's your, how you vote and how you, how you conduct yourself out in this world lines up with the Word of God. It would be better to not vote at all than to go and to affirm the, the nonsense that's out there right now. It would be better to not even pull a vote as it would to go and vote for something that goes against God's Word. But at the same time, there's a ditch on the other side where everybody tries to manipulate that. And, and you know, when you go back into the book, when you really begin to study this, you'll see where they, where they would say, pray for the ones that have the rule over. Pray for the leaders in position that God put them there. And we think, well, we don't want leaders like that. Well, they didn't want Nero there either. They didn't want the gardens of Nero's, uh, Nero's parties to be lit up with the bodies of Christians, but it still said pray for them. Why? Because it's a mindset. It's more than something outwardly. It's more than something to come to church and to shout, speak in tongues. I believe in shouting. I believe in speaking in tongues. I believe in every bit of that. He run around this church when he baptized me in the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you right now, you ain't going to get the real Holy Ghost if your heart ain't right. And if you don't examine and you don't get the inside cleaned up, that outside, you cannot clean it up good enough. It's a dead corpse and you may, you may decorate it up to look good, but, it, but it's going to rot. Amen? So if you go through the first book, oh, let's go through it. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. The Bible said, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. There are, lot, there are too much fortune telling going on in modern Christianity. What do you need the Holy Ghost for? You don't need the Holy Ghost for fortune telling. You don't, have, you don't need the Holy Ghost to, because the Holy Ghost ain't going to make an educated guess. You know, people say, well, I, I, God told me that this is going to happen. Well, if it don't come to pass, the Bible says you're a false prophet. And, you know, that don't mean that you excommunicate somebody and you never want them to ever be in the church. It just shows you that they was listening to the flesh. And as long as people listen to the flesh, you don't need to listen to them. If they're listening to the flesh, that flesh is going to tell you whatever you want it to say. And the Bible said, if the blind lead the blind, will they not both fall into the ditch? Yes, the Holy Ghost can foresee things, but at the same time, it, it, he's, not so, it, he's not so wrapped up in this outward stuff as much as he is a life of application. John 16 13, he, Jesus said, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. It does say he will show you things to come. But it says he will guide you into all truth. And then he goes on and he said, And he, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Why do we need the Holy Ghost? Because the power of the Holy Ghost is not merely to decipher current events. It's rather to preach Jesus. What we need more of instead of educated guesses and trying to figure out, well, is Russia the great bear and what about the dragon of China? It's like, I'll tell you what we need to be preaching. We need to be preaching Jesus. We need to get back in this, preach Jesus Christ, preach the power of God, preach the old time salvation, the Holy Ghost baptism. You know, I, I get questions all the time. Well, what about the end? What about the tribulation and the rapture? I believe in the rapture of the church. I believe the rapture, I know what the word rapture means. I've studied it inside out and backwards. This simply means a catching away. And there's not a doubt in my mind that the church is getting caught out of here. If it ain't, then 1 Corinthians 15 is wrong and Thessalonians is wrong. Because the Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not a doubt in my mind about the rapture of the church. The only argument that anybody ever has about it is when it's going to happen. But you know what I say? I don't get wrapped up in it. I say live in such a way that if that trumpet sounds right now, let's just head out of here. 
And if we have to go through something, be like the Apostle Paul and smile as you say, for I am now ready to be offered in the time of my departures at hand. You walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And that's what a lot of religion is. Nothing more than spiritual idolatry geared around the flesh that tries to mimic the flesh and puts a religious stamp on what the flesh wants to hear. If you stand and you say, well, you put in five, you get back 50, all it is is spiritual idolatry. Because all I'm trying to do is sell you something that will cater to your flesh. If I say give $5, that way $5 of that could be used to further the kingdom of God and maybe reach one more lost soul out there. That should, make, that should be plenty to put your money in the offering basket. Amen? Too many prophets want to tell you how every event plays out in eschatology but can't see their own problems or their church issues. A lot of people, they'll tell you everything. Well, this is going to happen, that's going to happen. It's like, well, what about the problems that's right in your own church? What about the problems in your own house? What about the problems that's in your own home? What about yourself? What about the problems you got yourself? You can't see them. You know, that's what it means to be a prophet is to be a seer. If I walk up into this pulpit and I don't see the problem of Lake Fort Church, you don't need me to stand in this pulpit. I've got no business being up here. If a shepherd cannot, cannot uh, read his flock and know what his flock needs, then he has no use for him whatsoever. Lord, show me something. You know the difference between a shepherd and a hireling is, a, is the hireling will flee. A hireling don't care a bit to feed. He don't care one bit to lead. They're more than happy to do that. But the difference is the shepherd will stand and fight for it. He'll protect those sheep and the hireling won't. A lot of people, as long as everything's going smooth for them, they're more than willing to stand and preach. I mean, man, they'd love to preach every time, the, every time they went to church, go all over the country trying to find a pulpit. If I wanted to find a pulpit, I could find one every night to stand somewhere and preach. But at the end of the day right now, what I've been called to do is protect this little flock. It's to make sure that when you stand before God that you have been given every opportunity. You know, when we give our baby dedications, that's what we'll say. We make parents make a vow before God that they will provide their children uh, every benefit of home and the church. Well, I want you to have the same thing. Whenever you come to this church, I want you to have every benefit. I don't want anybody to stand and tell me that you didn't tell me. Amen? Amen. So go on to Acts chapter. Well, it says that the Holy Ghost, it says, he'll, uh, he, you, it says you'll receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. It says that it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. They want to know, all right, now is the kingdom of Israel getting ready to be established? I mean, after all, the Old Testament prophets said that there was going to be one that was come, that was going to sit on the throne of David. He'd rule the nations with a rod of iron. He was saying, and the disciples, I mean, they was with bated breath saying, all right, is this getting ready to happen? He said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which a father has put in his own power. But he turns right around and he says, but you shall receive power. The power wasn't to, to stand and make these grand old statements about the end times. The point of the power was is to give them the power to go out into a world and preach Jesus Christ. Amen. Go to Acts chapter 2. Very familiar passage of Scripture. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were in one place in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. 120 of them were filled. Well, why feel anybody? Why in the world do you need to feel anybody? You know what was happening? There was 120 vessels there that the Spirit of God was being poured out into. If you really want the power and you really want to be pleasing to God and you want to make sure that that demon don't get inside of you, you know what you need? You need to be an open vessel. You need to take the cap off that thing and let him fill that thing up. There are a lot of people, they'll never take the cap off. They go to church, but they never take the cap off. They want to be around religious stuff, the Holy Ghost will move but it never gets in them. And you know what you need to do? You got to take the cap off and let him fill you up. The only purpose that you'll ever find as being a Christian is when you're filled up with the Holy Ghost and the power of God is flowing out of you. Then you can help somebody else. Amen. That's it. Who was it? Uh, it was uh, D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said you could take a bottle and put it under the Niagara, and if the cork is not out of it, it'll never get a drop of water in it. Just going to church ain't going to do it for you. Just sitting in a church service and listening to preaching, listening to singing ain't not going to do it for you. 
You've got to be a receiver. The Bible says you'll receive power. You'll receive. You've got to be a receiver. You know, if I, if I throw something to you, if you don't receive it, it'll hit you right in the face. If you don't open your hands and receive it, I've done that with Brunel one time. I gave Brunel a little gift for Christmas. If you was here, it was kind of comical, really, because I pretty much had to write him a letter and tell him to open the thing. And he'd look at it, and I said, that's for you, Brunel. That's for you, Brunel. That all right, ain't it, Brunel? Yeah. And that's for you, and you know how he does. He'll turn his head, and he got all nervous, and finally after 30 minutes, he walked up here and got it, and he walked back here and sat with it. Then still didn't open. I said, that's for you, Brunel, that's for you. And finally, after a while, he tore the thing open. But that gift can be for you. Peter stood up that day on the day of Pentecost. He says, for the promise is unto you and your children and them that are far off, even as many as the Lord thy God shall call. But if you don't receive it, if you don't want it, you know some people, well, I'm afraid if I, I'm afraid this will happen to me. You ain't going to get anything if you don't want it to happen. You don't have to worry about getting the Holy Ghost if you don't want the Holy Ghost. One of the old time, I love listening to them old time preachers, them old time Pentecost preachers. He said they was one of them years ago. He said they was a, had a little Pentecost mission down at this place. And he said her daddy was a, this girl's daddy was, uh, went to a different kind of church. And on her way home from school, she'd have to walk by that Pentecost church. And so they told her, said, now when you get by that, get, get away from that face as you can. Run past it. They got some kind of powder or something they sprinkle on you. Makes you act weird. And she'd get about a block from it and take off running and run as fast as she could. But later on, she got a hold of it and she figured out what it is. You ain't going to get anything if you don't receive it. What they was doing, those 120, they tarried, They was tarrying in an upper room to receive. Why was they wanting to receive? Because he said, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, not for yourself. But it says, and you will be a witness to me. You'll be a witness for Jesus Christ. Why do you need the Holy Ghost? It's to glorify God. One, one scripture says they received the Holy Ghost, spake in other tongues, and magnified God. The Holy Ghost will magnify God in your life. You need the Holy Ghost. You need to receive the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. When Jesus walks up that day, opens the row of Isaiah, and he begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He lays the scroll down. He said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. You think people liked it? By the time he got done preaching, they wanted to throw, that was when they wanted to throw him off the brow of the hill. They didn't like it. Just because you're anointed don't mean people's going to like it. Matter of fact, the more anointed you get, the more people are not going to like it. I can tell you the messages that I have felt most anointed is the ones I'll get the most attacks on Facebook or get shunned after church. I can just, I can tell you right now. But it's not about winning a popularity contest. It's about preaching the Word of God. It's about being a vessel that God can use that for, for His own glory. And it says, that as the Spirit gave them utterance, and it goes on, and it says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation. And when the noise uh, when it was noise to browse, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard every man speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are, we not, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we speak, or how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, it says we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. The Holy Ghost not only will give you a tongue, it will give you something to say. Amen. It's not just, listen, it's not just about getting into a bit of emotionalism to where you rattle off some syllables. That's not what it's about. Tongues, either way that speaking in tongues comes, will do one of two things. One, it will either edify the believer or it will edify the church if it's interpreted. And that's, that's, a, that's a debate for another day. But, but regardless, if, you're, if you begin, the Bible says that, you, that building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, 1 Corinthians 14, says edifies himself. The tongues when you are praying and when you are uh, privately praying or worshiping God, if you're worshiping, Listen, let me explain this for just a second. This is Bible study, right? 
If you're praying and worshiping God in a church service and tongues comes out, that does not have to be, that does not have to be interpreted. That is not between you and somebody else. That is between you and God. And I'll guarantee you if the Holy Ghost is speaking, he'll understand exactly what's being said because the Bible says that the Spirit makes, makes uh, intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered. And when you know not how to pray for as you ought, the Holy Ghost will begin to speak through you. Amen? So when you're worshiping, when you're down praying in private devotion or even worshiping God and tongues comes out, that does not have to be interpreted according to the Bible. If you get up and make a show of that and you are addressing that outwardly to other people as a ministry gift, it had better be interpreted. And if it's not, it's out of line. And, you, and the Bible says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. If I walked up here in this pulpit and I preached this message in Spanish, I can't, but if I, if I preached in Spanish, how would that edify anybody in here that didn't speak Spanish? That's what he was saying. It'd be better to speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others than 10,000 in an unknown tongue. And people corrupt those scriptures. And they blaspheme the Holy Ghost when they begin to say, well, that's of the devil. You honestly tell me, you read the book of Acts, you read through 1 Corinthians, and you tell me that's, I read the whole New Testament. Read the Old Testament, it doesn't matter. Go to Isaiah, for this is the rest wherewith I cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, for with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this generation. And, and go right on where, where Joe, it says, and in the last day saith God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You, no way can somebody honestly tell me that they think that's of the devil unless they just don't know what they're talking about. Now, if you don't know the scriptures and you're listening to what some preacher that don't know what he's talking about get up and say it's of the devil, you better be careful of that. Amen. You're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. But again, it has to be done in order. But, but when it says they, they spoke in tongues that day, there are other places that it was not interpreted. House of Cornelius was not interpreted. At Samaria, it was not interpreted. When Paul said, I pray in the Spirit, it, it, he didn't say I always interpret it. When the upper coast of Ephesus did not say it was interpreted, but this one it did. Because it was the most crowded day in, in, of, of Judaism and that was the most uh, crowded, populated day in Jerusalem at the Feast of, of Pentecost where, every, where, where Jerusalem would have more people and the Bible says that they all come together. There was a commotion going on. They, the, the cloven tongues of fire began to set on them. They began to speak in other tongues. <coughs> 3,000 were added to the church that day. Imagine how many people heard it. Amen. But Because some of them was confused. Matter of fact, they said these men are full of new wine. But some of them believed because we have 3,000 converts added that day. But the miracle of that was not just that they spoke in tongues. The miracle was also that it wasn't just glossolalia. It was also they had something to say. Because it says we do hear them speak in our, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Amen. Go down to verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them. That's whenever they, you know, began to say, well, these men are full of new wine. Peter stood up and told them, these are not drunk as you suppose. And he goes on. But as he begins to preach, he delivers his inaugural address of the church. And as he preaches that day, look at some of the words that he says here. He says again, these are not drunk as you suppose, sin, but third hour of the day. But this is that. goes back and quotes a, quotes a prophet that was 900 years before Christ, the prophet Joel. And then he goes and he says in verse 23, Him, talking about Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Well, that's a message, ain't it? You know, a lot of times as long as it's bubble gums and tiptoeing through the tulips and all this stuff, it's fine with people. When Peter stood up that day and began to preach, he wasn't patting everybody on the back. Instead, he turns around and he says, you, he said, he said, this had to happen by the determinate foreknowledge, counsel of foreknowledge of God. He said, but your wicked hands have crucified him and slain him. And he goes on in verse 36. It says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. In his message, he didn't hold anything back from him. There was a boldness. Why do you need the Holy Ghost? It gives you something to say for one thing. Also, it gives you a boldness. If you'll remember back 50 days prior to this, you had this same man blaspheming God. You had him lying, saying he didn't even know Jesus. You had him as a coward standing there who wouldn't even look at a little girl and say, yeah, I know that man. So you had a blaspheming, lying coward 50 days before that something happened. 
What happened to him? I'll tell you exactly what happened. On the day of Pentecost, that rush and mighty wind that come down and filled that vessel, put a boldness in him, and he stood right there. He wasn't, he wasn't worried about what anybody thought about it. If they had been hanging the cross up to crucify him, he'd have still looked them right in the eye. And he said, you crucified him. You killed him. He said, by the determined foreknowledge of God, you crucified him and killed him. And when he gets done preaching, then they begin to say what must we do to be saved and Peter begins to tell them you need to repent you need to get baptized you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost and it says save yourself from this untoward generation Amen. Simon Peter the blaspheming coward liar became the church's greatest statesman on the day of Pentecost Acts chapter 2 verse 41 and they that were we're not going to go through the whole book the whole 10 chapters this slow I promise you but Maybe. I, I shouldn't have promised anything. Acts chapter 2 and verse 41. And they, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We had a revival a couple of years ago. And uh, 160 people. And I mean, I'm telling you, it was the most. Wasn't it just amazing to live during that time? For them 76 nights, it was just like heaven on earth to me. I, I'm telling you, I, I had to work, I and mean, we had to work right through it and work out a lot of times in the snow and everything else. But to me, it was, and I knew it, I, even at the time I knew it. I knew it was just like, I knew it. we was getting a, a taste of what, what the Bible calls the earnest of the Spirit, just a little taste of what, it, of what heaven has to be like. To watch people heartbroken walk down these aisles and to watch them come and pray. And it's like, I mean, it was every night, one night we sat over here, Johnny said, they're coming in droves right now. There was seven or eight people stepped out, sinners walking up here to pray at these altar rails. And I knew, I even at the time, I said, church, we're going to look back at this and wish we could be back in them. And, and it's true. I wish, we was, I wish I could go back and relive that all over again. That was, that was the greatest 76 nights of my life. But it says on this day there was 3,000 souls added to the church one day. One message that didn't take over, over three or four minutes to preach. And there was 3,000 souls added to the church. But this is what gets me is because then read what it says. It wasn't just about the miracle and about the tongues and about the Holy Ghost coming. Yes, it was, it was all great. But at the same time it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It, does, it seems to me like the early church had more than we have. Would you agree with that? I mean, you have to agree with it. It's, it's empirical evidence would prove that, you know, they had more than we did. Why did they have more than we did? Because they emptied their vessels more than we do. The reason why they had more is because they emptied their self more. The reason why we don't get any more than what we've got is because we're not willing to let go of some things. Amen. You say, you're preaching some sort of socialism? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that capitalism has its demons too. When we're wealthy and when we're blessed, I'll tell you when the church has its greatest revivals is at the time of greatest persecution. There's not a doubt about it. Read the historic, read the historical facts of revivals, and you'll see it's whenever they, whenever there's more persecution, when there was more at stake, they had greater revivals. But instead, it's you know we we want to complain about how high the gas is and and how come we don't you know how come our checks ain't any bigger and how come this and that. It's like. That day when they got, after they got the Holy Ghost, they sold everything they had. They let their fishing boats rot. Or if they sold them, they took the money out and gave it to the poor. I'm not saying that we have to do, I'm not saying we have to. I'm not saying we shouldn't, though. I'm saying we want to see the power of God, and we do believe we're in the closing seconds of human history. And the Bible makes it very clear about, about them that would covet after the things of this world, pierce their self through with many sorrows. And anybody with any money could tell you that. The more money you get, the more problems you got. Amen. Oh, that ain't fun, is it? Nobody wants to preach that. But we want the power. What I'm saying is there's, that somewhere there's this disconnect between application and it actually 
and, and in theory. It's like, okay, we read it. Yeah, we would love to have that. I mean, wouldn't it be awesome to walk by and your shadow passing by would, would heal the sick? But the miracle of that is not just that it would happen. It was that people had so much confidence in them that they would bring them out. That people had confidence in them. And listen, church, there, there is people in this church house right now that when I walk out into a world, they talk about some of these older saints of God. I mean, they almost venerate them of how, of how holy they are. And I agree with them. I agree with them. When they talk about, you know, this little thing that went on back a few months ago when they was attacking, well, the church, uh, too legalistic and this, uh, you know, this and that. I'm thinking, I'll guarantee you when they stand at the judgment, see, you take all these old saints of God that have sat on these old pews and them old pews over there who give everything and they, they spent their life in prayer and fast and dedication to God. Right now, they're reaping the rewards of that. And you can play fast and loose with it in this world. You can miss out and maybe miss everything. Amen? But they was willing to get rid of all of it. Why did they have more? Because they emptied themselves more. And I'll leave it right there. Go on to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 and verse 12. Acts chapter 3 talks about the man that laid at the gate beautiful. And the Bible says he laid there for years. And, and when Peter and John walked up to the temple to pray, he said, uh, you know, he was begging for alms. And Peter said, look on us. You know, the modern idea in the church is, well, don't, don't do what I do, do what I say. That's not the way a Christian should live. A Christian, when he walks out these doors, should say, look at me. And I'm not saying it in a boastful way. I'm saying that if you want to follow, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. People should be able to follow your example. They should have confidence in you. They should see what you do and have so much confidence in you that they want to go to church where you go to, that they want to hear the message, that they want what you've got. That's the reason I'm standing in this pulpit right now. I've said it plenty of times. I watched people that I, that I had confidence in that I knew would not, would not fake this, and I'd watch the power of God get on them, and they wasn't a bit embarrassed to let the power of God get on them, and I wanted what they had. Amen? Peter tells him, silver and gold famously says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Lifts him up, the man goes in leaping and praising God into the temple. Everybody comes back. This is what it says in Acts chapter 3 verse 12. It talks about how they had all come back and they were all looking at them. And it says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why... Look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk. Now if you don't think that's a miracle, you obviously don't know the life of Simon Peter. Simon Peter stuck his foot in his mouth more than any other apostle did. I mean, there was a time when they argued which of them would be the greatest. Remember? They argued which of us will be the greatest. And Jesus had to take a little child and bring him into the midst of them and set him down and say, except you be converted, be like this little child, you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. Right. If you not remember whenever Jesus there, at, just before his, just before his uh, arrest, he begins to tell them, this night the, the shepherd, uh, they'll smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And he begins to say, all of you will deny me. What did Simon Peter do? Simon Peter said, though I'll forsake you, I never will. He was saying, this bunch of low-life losers here, I, yeah, I could see how they would run, but not me. And the Lord looks at him and says, Simon Peter, he said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me thrice. Before the rooster crows twice, you're going to three times deny me, and that's exactly what happened to him. Then you have this same man who had wanted the glory, who it seemed like always was wanted to be put on a pedestal. Now he's got his opportunity. Now everybody has run out of the temple. Now everybody is running and they're looking at, at Peter and John and they're looking. And what does Simon Peter do? We want the power of the Holy Ghost in our life. It's when Simon Peter, to me, one of the greatest miracles is not just the man getting up that was lame. It's that Simon Peter would look at them and say, why are you looking at me? Why do you think that I have done anything with this? He said that Jesus, that same one that you killed, he's the one that made this man to walk. He was saying, I can't do anything. I honestly believe that's why we don't see more miracles in the church. I believe people want too much credit for it. That flesh wants to be the one that does it. That flesh wants to be the one in the prayer line with a hand on them and say, boy, I, I felt that. 
I just felt something come out of me. Amen. Amen. That flesh wants to get the credit for it. It's like, well, I went to this other church and I preached and this and got saved and I prayed for them and they got healed. It's like, well, for one thing, you didn't heal them. I mean, you know, I can't save anybody. If I could, I'd save everybody, but I can't. I can't give you the Holy Ghost. I can't heal you. I can't do anything. Simon Peter that day, he said, why are you looking at us? But he said, if you want to look to somebody, I'll tell you who you can look to. And he began to preach Jesus. It all goes back to this. When he, when the Holy Ghost, when the Comforter is come, he'll glorify me. He'll speak of me. He'll, he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. You know, I've had people ask me before if I had a good memory. I really don't. I can't remember hardly what I had for breakfast this morning. But when I get anointed, I could, I could about remember that whole Bible. It's when the anointing comes. And there's a world of difference between what you can do in the flesh and what you can do in the spirit. Amen. And whenever the, it's in that spirit, because that's what he said, I will bring all things to remember whatsoever I have said unto you. He ain't going to bring stuff back to me that does not pertain to him. But if you read that Bible and you get that Bible inside of you, whenever you need it, those scriptures will come to life. That's why the Bible says that when you appear before kings and magistrates, when you appear before the governors of this world, take no thought of what you'll say because in the self-same hour, he said, I'll give you the words to say. Simon Peter that day didn't walk around trying to find him a lame man to heal, but instead when he walked by, the spirit quickened in him and said right there, go over and talk to that man. As he began to talk, I believe it was the Lord talking out of his mouth. I don't believe even Simon Peter even knew what he was even hardly saying saying more than it just coming out that him saying silver and gold I don't have but what I do have I'll give you Amen. I told you one of my favorite preachers Burt Clendenin I love that old man if you want some good solid preaching listen to Burt Clendenin dead and gone now but buddy he's a preacher and he said I was listening to him today and he was talking about the time when he was down he said having a revival meeting he said the guy come through I had a prayer line going and said the guy walked by and he said, uh, they was praying to get healed, and he said, I was, he said, I took my hand to lay on him, and he said, when I laid my hand on him, I was going to say, uh, Lord, would uh, heal this man, you know, but he said, I heard myself say, you'll see in the morning, and he said, the devil fought me all night, why did you say that? Why did you say, you'll see in the morning? And he said, all night, he said, I, I fought that. He said, next day we got back to church, and he said, come to find out. That guy, uh, he said, that guy's eyes had got burned out in a chemical explosion. There was a plant and a, there'd been an explosion and it burned his eyeballs out of his head. And he said, the whole time I was worried about if that man would even come back. And he said, here in a little bit, I seen that car coming down that road. And he said, when a lot closer it got, the more I realized it wasn't the woman driving, it was that man driving. And he said, we got that. I said, I got him up, asked him to get on the pulpit and ask him to testify. And he told about his eyes being burnt out in a chemical explosion. And he said, this morning, he said, I went to, uh, went to pull the patches off my eyes to put some salve on them or to scratch them. And he said, there was two eyeballs looking out of them places where there'd been no eyeballs. I believe that. Church, you say, well, I'm not for that. I do believe that. I believe every bit of that. I believe the power of God. I believe Burrow can get out of that church. I do believe that. I believe Burrow can get out of that church. I believe we can see things. I believe he said greater things than this. And I'm not saying that to get a rise out of the crowd. I'm saying that if we get our heart right and we wouldn't be focused on us getting the attention and we would pray and say, Lord, that you would get glory, that my name don't have to be even mentioned. Uh, raise up a child. Raise up a, a 12-year-old kid to walk up here and believe that word for what it says and lay hands on him and get him out of that, that you would get the glory. No flesh can glory in his presence, but instead we try to cater to this flesh and commit spiritual idolatry geared toward the flesh, and then we want to know why we don't see the power of God. <clears throat> you can go on with this, but I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not going to keep you, but Acts chapter 4, they was arrested for healing the man. They didn't like it because the man got healed at the gate beautiful. The religious crowd didn't like it. They got mad about it. You think just because something good's going to happen that the devil's going to like it? He hated the revival we had. You remember how many times they tried to shut this thing down? We was the most reported place in Morgan County. I took it as a badge of honor. I mean, I'm telling you, we got word of that. You are the most reported place in Morgan County getting word where they're going to write your license plate number. And I thought, man, you're going to have to threaten more than that. 
I mean, you're going to have to lead some of us out of here in handcuffs if you're going to shut this revival down. You ain't going to, not going to happen. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, they they was arrested and they was told, don't preach that anymore. And I could just see the smirk on their face. Like, are you kidding me? We just got filled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody get filled with the Holy Ghost called to preach. You couldn't make them quit preaching. They'd preach to a rock if they was out in the woods. I've done it before. I squirrel hunted and preached before. You think I'm wrong? I've broke down road preaching to myself. I heard Johnny say that the other day. Johnny said he preached to himself before. I've done it before too. I preached to myself plenty of times. I'm just talking, and I'm not saying just I'm preaching to myself right now. I'm talking about just me. Nobody else around, just me. Amen. <laughs> Acts chapter 5. <coughs> Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphire. Now it gets serious. It's one thing to bless things to people. It's one thing just to preach to people. But then you have Ananias and Sapphire. Ananias and Sapphire took it upon themselves to lie to the Holy Ghost. And Peter never let them sit in that church house. You know what most, what the modern church would do? The modern church would never kill a tither. Modern church would never call out a sin of somebody putting a big offering in the offering basket. Because the Bible says they gave back, they, they give a portion of it. They give most of it. They sold their land. Say if they sold a piece of ground for today's money for $50,000, they give 40 of it to the church. Said they give it all. Simon Peter, was what he was saying is, I don't need your money. God don't need your money. He owns it all. Anyhow, you think you're going to come in here and just get a, get a plaque put up to your name because you donated some money into the offering? Listen, that's, that's not what it's about. Now, it's what the modern church has turned it into. This prosperity stuff, and you know, you yeah, sow a seed of a thousand dollars. Simon Peter could have cared less if they sowed forty seeds of a thousand dollars. If they lied to the Holy Ghost and they stood there and lied, he called them out, called them out for what they'd done. And the Bible says that judgment came right in that church house and killed both of them in a church service. The boy would be a way to we would think would kill a revival, wouldn't it? God come down and start killing people for lying. So there'd be, some, there'd be some people hurting, I can tell you that right now. <laughs> I better go past that at me. Simon Peter had the power not to be obsessed with wealth. They'd tried it before and he wasn't, gonna, he wasn't manipulated by it. But this is what it says. After the Ananias and Sapphire died, the Bible says that fear came, fear came upon people. And this is what it says. It says in verse 14, and believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and of women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. I love that passage of Scripture. Because, again, it's not just that they had so much power that, the, that their shadow would pass by. It's that people had so much confidence in them that they would get them up in couches and beds and lay them out. And they would see a man of God walking down the street. And they would lay them out hoping, looking at the sun, trying to figure out, all right, the sun's shining this way. If we lay him right here, Simon Peter will have to walk by. And that shadow passing by. Boy, is that not when people's got confidence in you? Well, I'm going to tell you what, until the church begins to stand up for what's right. That's why, that's why people uh, don't have a lot of confidence in the modern Pentecostal church. It's because they've let down the standard. They've let down the way they should live. They've let down preaching on the Holy Ghost. They've let down the judgment. They've let down everything. And they've capitulated and begin to act just like the world. And trying to rub elbows with the ecumenical world. And people's lost their confidence in the Pentecost church. People ain't going to have confidence in in the Pentecost church just because you can speak in tongues and shout in a church service when they have confidence in you it's when you walk out into a world without spot, without blemish, without a wrinkle where they can't find anything to attack you with. That's when they have confidence in you. Amen? Then they got arrested. Verse 18, it says they got arrested, put them in a common prison. Angel of the Lord come down, opened the, opened the prison doors. You know what he told them to do? He didn't tell them, go, now go run, hide. This is what he says. Go and stand in the temple. Uh, go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. They was arrested. Took them out of the street, arrested them, put them, put them in a jail cell. An angel comes down, opens the door up. Tells them, now don't go and hide. What I want you to do is you made them mad standing in their street. Walk right in their temple now. They didn't like out there on the street corner, walk up in their pulpit now. 
Walk up and tear this thing down. Tear this religious sham that's going on. Tear it down. Stand there and preach. Preach Jesus Christ to them. Don't be ashamed of me. Don't go and hide. Go and stand in the temple. And that's not, Can you imagine being, being the one that had arrested them the night before? The Bible said they put them back. They was going to question them. Next morning they called for them. Said, now go get, go get them. Go get, the, go get Peter and John. They come back and say, well, um, they're not there. Well, where are they? Well, we need to go find them. Well, it ain't going to be hard to find them. They're standing in your temple preaching right now. It ain't going to be hard to find them. Listen, this is not about hiding. Modern church has got way too good at hiding. I feel good. I ain't got much voice tonight, but I do feel really, really good tonight. Because it's like, I get so sick of this reed shaking with the wind nonsense. It's like people go to one church and they'll preach whatever that church, whatever that church believes in. I mean, man, you would think if they went to a Methodist, there's a Methodist church. If you think there's a Baptist, I ain't got a thing wrong with them. I, I believe we all need more, and I believe they need more, and I'll stand right here and tell you they need more. They need the Holy Ghost. They need the power of God in their life. Amen. But they'd go to wherever church they was in, they'd preach their doctrine. This ain't about preaching doctrine. It ain't about preaching denomination. This ain't church politics. I'm not trying to get you in my pocket or win favor with you. What we're supposed to be doing is standing up, preaching the words of this life. That's what it says. Go stand in the temple and preach the words of this life. Preach the word of God. Paul told Timothy, he said, you preach that word. You be instant in season, out of season, when everybody's amen and you preach, when it's crickets in the church, preach it anyhow. You preach when they like you, preach when they don't like you. But he said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Amen. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. It ain't up to me whether you endure it. It's my job to preach it. And he told them, he said, you go stand in the temple. And then he goes on. It says that uh, they, they call him. They said, did we not straightly command you to, that you should not teach in this name? Verse 28, and behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered, said, we ought to obey God rather than man. And to him, and to him, it goes on verse 40, uh, verse 40, they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. They beat them. They flogged them for preaching the word of God. And it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They told them, don't preach it anymore. We're going to let you go. We're going to beat you. And we don't want, if you want more of what you just got, just keep preaching it. <laughs> well, all right. And they walked back into a world and they preached it again. Amen. And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for him. When the apostle Paul said, I glory in tribulation, what's that mean? When he says, I glory in tribulation, I glory in my infirmities. Why would he say that? We know why he said it. Because if, if, if the devil wasn't fighting you, then you'd have nothing to rejoice about. But more than that, I believe the rejoicing. I believe when Paul said, I glory in my tribulation. I believe as they rejoiced is that, that they was able to stand there. That they didn't back down. See, I hear people, uh, the, I hear this, this, this idea going around. Well, what if we had to go through the great tribulation? What if they was cutting people's heads off? Would we be able to stand? Only one way to find out. One, only one way to find out. And that's to have to go through persecution. And you say, well, we'll never have to go through it. I'm not saying we'll have to go through the great tribulation, but there are people all over this world that's going through tribulations right now. They're cutting their heads off. They're burning them in iron baskets, putting them over the fire and, and burning them to death. They're killing them every way you imaginable. And read through the churches, uh, read through Fox's Book of Martyrs, read through the history and the martyrs of the church, and you'll see how they died. But you know what? They rejoiced when they walked out there. You know why? I, I really, the Lord showed me that they. I believe the reason why they rejoiced is because they stood against it. They got beat and not one of them backed down. 
I believe the power of God came down on them. I believe that same Holy Ghost that came down in Acts chapter 2, I believe it come right down as they was getting flogged and beaten. I believe when the Apostle Paul, he said five times, had I 40 stripes save one, he'd had 195 rods or 195 times had the rod been laid to his back. But he said, I can glory in tribulation. I believe they, I believe when they walked out, I believe they was, they was glad to say, you know what? I was afraid that I might back up. I was afraid I might recant. But when, it, when the persecution came, I was able to stand. Church, if me and you get filled up with the Holy Ghost, if we'll get the real power of God in our life, and we're not worried about just doing it so people look at us, but get it in such a way that we want to bring Him, uh, that we want to bring Him glory. I believe when persecution arises, I believe when things happen in your life, you'll be able to stand. And if you don't, it'll be like the Bible says, when the storm came, it'll knock down that house because it was only founded upon the sand. And I'm about done while she gets ready for a song. Acts chapter 6 and 7 is is Stephen. Stephen standing there preaching to him. And, you know, this is a man that is not one of the apostles. Probably one of the deacons of the church or just somebody that's been, that's been set in as a, with a position in the church. But he wasn't a, one of the apostles, just simply a follower of Christ. And they, uh, they take him out to, and going to stone him to death and they ask him to give an account and he begins to preach to them. And the Bible says that as he preached it, his face became as it were the face of an angel. And he preached to them and, and it, to me it's, it's, It's so, uh, let's use a big word, exegetical. It's just like it all breaks it down. He goes down the list. It's like, all right, let's start back at Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and let's go down the list and let's go to Moses and let's go to Joshua and let's go down the list. But it's, it's like something begins to stir up in him. And as he gets down to the farther along he gets, he looks at them and he, I mean, it's like he's giving them a history lesson of their, this is Jews he's talking to. This is Pharisees who knew their own history. But he's preaching to them. And it's like as he gets down the list, it's like something happens in him. And all of a sudden he says, he begins to say, you uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do you. (coughs) And he begins to preach. I mean, it's just like the fire comes out of his voice. And they stick their fingers in their ears and run on him and begin to stone him to death. And he stands and he looks, as he's getting killed. I mean, you imagine what it would be like to be stoned to death as they're beating you to death. I mean, you know, we think of throwing some rocks, but really imagine what it would look like for a person to be stoned to death. As the stones take half the side of your head off and eyes hanging out of socket, teeth are being broken, bones being broken. I mean, you have to die from blood loss or, or uh, blunt trauma. And he's laying there, his dying breaths, gasping breaths, It's not like he recants. He looks up and he says, I see Jesus standing to the right hand of God. I say that and I get teared up and I get chills thinking about it. Everywhere else in Scripture, and I mean, I may be reading into it more than, but every place else you see where Jesus is sitting to the right hand of the Father. But at this point, he said, I see him standing. And it's like all of heaven stands up to take notice of a man who won't back down. I still believe that's the thing. I still believe he still stands up. I believe there's still something for somebody that won't back up. Somebody that'll stand and when it's not popular, still preach it anyhow. And just stand and preach it line upon line, precept upon precept, whether it breaks people or whether it makes them repent. But regardless, just keep preaching. And as he's dying breath, he said, I see Jesus. And he says, lay not this sin to their charge. What love. What love for somebody as they kill you to stand and say, don't lay this sin to their charge. We think of Jesus when he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But this wasn't Jesus. This wasn't even an apostle. This was just somebody in a low position in the church, in a position in the church. And he says, Father, or he says, lay not this sin to their charge. <coughs> Acts chapter 8, you have the revival in Samaria. Again, the Bible says that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. When Samaria got saved, they wasn't going to let them be without the Holy Ghost. So they called for Peter and John. They come up, prayed for them, and they began to receive the Holy Ghost. The Bible said it was a man named Simon. It's where we later on in church history, we get the word Simony when people try to buy church offices. 
But this man would, um, this man told Peter, he said, well, why don't you, he said, I'll give you some money. I'll buy that. If you'll, if you'll give me that power to be able to lay hands on people, give them the Holy Ghost, he said, I'll, I'll pay for it. Peter said, your money perishes with you because thou hast thought the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither lot nor uh, part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Lord, give me this. The Holy Ghost kept them from the wealth and the materialism. We want the power of God. You know, we want the power of God. We want to see the miracles, and we want to see the glory of God, and we want to see a revival, and we want to see our family saved, and we want to see all these things. But one of the things that in this that the Lord showed me with this is that that same Holy Ghost that the shadow of Peter passing by would heal the sick also kept them from uh, time and again from giving over to the money and the wealth of this world. I mean, you see it over and over in the in the Book of Acts about how they could how they could have got positions, how they could have got wealth, how they could have. They sold everything they had. Man, they sold everything that they had. They had all things common. When, when Ananias and Sapphira tried to give them some money, give them a big bunch of money, they said, you know, your money, I mean, it's like, you lied to the Holy Ghost, we don't want your money, get them out of here. When Simon, when Simon said, I'm wanting to buy that, I want to give you some money for that, he said, you have no lot in this matter because he says your heart's not right with God. But that's where a lot of modern Pentecostals lose it. A lot of modern Pentecostals I mean, you know this to be true. Think of the big name preachers. Think of the preachers that you have seen in the past that had the power of God in their life. I mean, they was anointed. They was used of God. And then money began to corrupt them. Think of the singing groups. Some of the big singing groups that once had an anointing on their life and they sung for the glory of God and they had an anointing to them. And then they began to look like, act like, get wrapped up in the things of this world little by little. They're... Their outward appearance showed exactly what was in their heart, and they lost their anointing. You say, well, that's them. No, it can happen right here in the church house, too. Amen. We can get so wrapped up in money and wealth and materialism and jobs and things like that, and I've seen it happen. You know, I know, I know people, they, they get mad at me for that. They're like, well, it ain't none of your business. Well, I'm your pastor. It is my business. I mean, if you choose not for it not to be my business, then you need to find you another pastor. But as of right now, it is my business. If you was a doctor, I, I told somebody this the other day, but if you was a doctor that was a cancer doctor and you saw cigarettes kill a thousand people, do you think you would have an affinity for cigarettes? Do you think you would like them? Or do you think everybody that you saw smoking one, you'd say, hey, you need to quit smoking or it's going to kill you? What about if you was a doctor that dealt with cirrhosis of the liver and you'd watched a thousand people die because they drunk themselves to death? Do you think that you, would, that you would love alcohol? No, you would hate it. Well, what about me standing up here in this pulpit or preachers that stand in the pulpit and they watch what the effects of sin does? They watch what happens when people start not taking this serious, and I see it happening. I can sit here and watch it happening, and instead it's like somewhere this goes from, boy, I like that preaching, to I don't like that anymore. It's like the only reason, it's, it's just because it's starting to affect you. The only reason I do it, it's not to gain. I have nothing. I don't get paid here. You understand? I don't get paid. I just... I come, I preach one of these days, I'll get my reward in heaven, I, I'm fully aware of that. But I have nothing to gain by, by that at all except to see you make it to heaven. And I want each and every person that's sitting in this congregation tonight, I want you to make it to heaven. And for me, I think the, the best way for you to make it to heaven is get filled with the Holy Ghost, the real Holy Ghost in your life. I think that is the best thing that could happen to you to assure you that you'll make it into God's good heaven is get filled with the Holy Ghost and let him guide you because the Bible said when the comfort of the paraclete, one who walks alongside you and guides you, when he comes along and guides you, he'll guide you into all truth. And what the devil wants to do is to keep you in that gray area, take that comforter away from you, take the Holy Ghost away from you, tell you you don't need that, you can do it yourself, but... I'm going to tell you right now, I don't believe that I could have stood. I don't believe I could have made it this long if I didn't have the Holy Ghost in my life. I believe too many things. There's been too much stuff that's come against me, but it took me out. And I believe you need the Holy Ghost. And I believe when we look back at this early church, Acts chapter 9 talks about Paul's conversion. Uh, Peter raises Dorcas from the dead. Acts chapter 10, the Gentiles' conversion. When they, were, they called for Simon to come, they prayed through, they received the Holy Ghost. Read through the first 10 books, the first 10 chapters of Acts. Read it for, it's not just for its talking points, 
not for the little things that you know that we that we readily come to mind. It's like, oh yeah, we know when we know when Paul got to, you know when his conversion got knocked to the ground. We know that, but read it all in its context. Read it all as one letter as it began. It was addressed here to Theophilus as Luke began to write this this letter and begin to look at what it's trying to teach me and you, because it's teaching us a life of application. It's called the Acts of the Apostles. The acts, the actions of the apostles. Not just something to fill up the book. It's, it's, it, is this, it is the historical book in the New Testament. It's considered, by, it's considered the historical book of the New Testament. The book of Acts is. But it's got its, it's, got its purpose. You know, and the old saying is, is those who do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. Well, in Christianity, if we don't understand the history of what, we, of, of where, what the church is, I'm afraid we'll be doomed to not repeat what they do. Albert Einstein famously said the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Well, we want, I don't want a different result. I want the result they had. I would love to have a church service to where Burl ain't sitting in that chair at the end of the church service. I'd love to see Shelly out of that chair. I'd love to see, I'd love to see people get healed. My wife got, got Sjogren's disease. Don't tell anybody about that. I mean, she don't let it be known, but, but I'd love to see her get healed of that. I would love to see you get healed. I'd love to be healed. i got a foot that's got foot drop. I'd like to be healed of that stuff. I want to see the power of God. only way we're going to get the power of God is we're going to have to mimic what they've done. We're going to have to look at them and say, I want what they've got because it's not a different Holy Ghost. It's not a different one. The Bible says, though the outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. The Holy Ghost never is not a day older. We can have that same, I know we can have that same Holy Ghost that they had, but we got to be willing to pay the price for it. Amen? Stand to your feet if you will. Stand to your feet if you will. These altars are open tonight. Listen, let's just all find us a place to pray. Again, the altars are simply a place where something dies, a place of sacrifice. If you want the Holy Ghost, you you know that's why some people won't even go to an altar. They don't want to. They, they don't want anybody to see them at, uh, up here at an altar. It's like, man, if you can't, can't be seen at an altar, I'm telling you, what about when you got the Holy Ghost in your life and you walk out into a world out there? Do you not want them to see you then? That night, the Lord told me to run around this church. You know, again, people say, well, you don't have to do any of that. Well, if I wasn't to run when He told me to run, how in the world could I walk up here and stand and preach a message that's going to offend? Half a congregation at times. You see what I'm getting at? This is a life that me and you have to live and we have to make up our mind that we're going to serve God and come what may, come what may, we're going to put Him first, foremost, that He is the main the main purpose of our life. That is my main purpose. I, I pray that that is the main purpose of my life revolves around bringing Him glory. So come on, let's all find a place to pray tonight. Let's all find a place to pray.
doubt Some folks may scorn Or may go wrong And just leave me Jesus too. 